Um, we're going to move quickly, so there's plenty of time for questions. Um, I'll go first, then the GIS Collective will do a, a little brief pop-in. We have Neil Lovelock from the Glasgow Eco Trust and Hannah Clinch from Tacit Design. So the big focus is on what's coming up. It's Climate Fringe Week, and um, it's also in New York. It's uh, Climate Week here as well. I think in many places where all eyes are going towards this moment where we have so much potential for positive change. So I'm gonna start with a little intro to Green Map. And um, we're a uh, movement that's now 25 or 30 years old. And we help people map, make maps about sustainability in their own community. So we offer on an open source basis, tools and support. We really wanna help empower local leadership and we're all creating green maps. Now, what is a green map? It's a um, locally made map that uses green map icons to highlight nature, culture, social justice, and green living. And we've already spread to 65 countries. These are some of the people involved. And you can get a sense of how different the local projects are managed just from this one image. And they might be led by um, community groups, designers, universities, governments, all sorts of people have led this project, all sorts of entities. And what we do here in New York is we're, we collect and connect is the main thing we, we do is we help people find each other and find examples that help them move forward in an easier way and we create new tools. And those are usually based on what we've experienced and what we've learned from working with people. So this movement is very much alive and still in learning mode as so much about mapping has changed just in the last 25 years. It's been remarkable. So we're enabling people to communicate, build connections, gain knowledge, build, and all do so many different things in their own community. Um, we're going to do some focus on our new mapping platform. This is our newest tool, and um, this is Mary Hunt's map from uh, um, Port Townsend area, and also a little bit of Romania is on there as well, but you can see the map different ways. We'll be talking more about that soon. Um, what links it all is the green map icons. So there are 170 icons that have been co-designed and developed over the last um, same number of years. <laughs> and part of the way we help spread this iconography is by providing it as a font. And that made it very easy for people early on. Now we provide it in many different formats, and including, if you like, even these um, GIFs. <laughs> How many of them focus on climate change? Well, it's hard to say because so many of the practices Green Maps have always promoted are have to do with climate change, in mitigating it, adapting to it, and reducing it. And you can see some of them go directly right to the heart of the matter as well. Um, about three, four years ago, we matched our icon set to the United Nations SDGs. So there's a way to make these important sustainable development goals visible at the, on the ground in your community. And we more recently, um, oh, let me, let me say we are always inspired by the icons across the top. These are some local examples from Cuba, from Victoria, from uh, Aichi, Japan, from Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and you can see they're about bats, deserts, whale watching, uh, beach combing bears, uh, local berries, um, <clears throat> a secondhand store, map makers, solar experts, and beavers. <laughs> but lately, we've also created a set around recovery icons. That's our 2020 set, public health, recuperation, and regeneration. And we're testing local foods. And I have to say, part of what instigated this is the work of Bogdan and Alexandra, who will be speaking next. They enabled multiple kinds of icons on our platform. And all of a sudden, that unleashed a new way of thinking about this tool set. Um, so we have a global website that shares all this at greenmap.org, 
but locally there's also a page about what we do in New York and we test stuff here. So um, we have a so we have our own local project in addition to the global. Um, and I'll show you the first climate map we made, and this was 2006, and we were focusing people's attention on energy and reasons to act now, every day and easy, and investments. And of course, climate change was all through that map, and this led to a whole suite of tools that teachers requested because there weren't that many that helped young people connect with these issues. Um, this became an interactive map in 2000, and, uh, when we opened our first mapping platform, so around 2010. A couple years later, Superstorm Sandy hit New York. I'm one of the people who thought, aha, Sandy is really going to be the game changer, and New York City is going to get on board in every way. We're still getting on board. But um, this, <laughs> this map, you could see the high water mark. You could, uh, at that um um, URL, you can also download the print map. So onward, we said, let's get out in the street. Let's talk to people. Let's find out what people are thinking, what they know about climate change. We started doing a whole series of events. And we are still doing these events, but they, um, here's, they led to different kinds of maps. So for example, the tours we did post Sandy led to this Lower East Ride map. And it was time to when bike share system hit the street and all of a sudden everybody had a much easier way to use bicycles as an everyday climate countermeasure. So um, we've also produced some related videos as mentioned at the bottom there. Um, we're not done doing these kind of events. Join us on Tuesday if you're nearby and um, we're doing a green infrastructure tour. And this is the map we made for last year's self-guided version. Um, but there's lots to see and think about right in the very few blocks of this neighborhood, which is one of those frontline coastal communities we hear so much about. Um, a couple summers ago, we created uh, a map that the idea was to fight heat island effect. The city was saying, get air conditioning, everybody. And we're saying, no, find a cool place. And of course, we focused in on some of the gardens and, um, and the focus was, healthy, cool, and free. So that was our criteria for this map. It was the first time we made a map on a Google Doc, on actually on a Google slide, which meant it's very easy to update and also for us to share that map with others who might want to pull out some of the language, add their own, we're fine with that. So that's our, a really open map. Um, we created a video called Bike Ready that looked at issues around um, how bicyclers got involved after Sandy. And we also created a series of GIFs. Actually, this was with Gene Gardner's students uh, pitched in on some of these um, to make these um, little uh, portable GIFs. There's been 25 million views. I just checked. I was very surprised to see that. We have so many. Um, so what else do we do at Green Map? Well, we pitched in, um, we pitched the city with the idea of adding a thousand street trees in 2019. 500 have been planted to date. And it's been very exciting to see this grow in our own neighborhood. We're still advocating for more stewardship and more native trees. Um, and I want to show you some of the tree mapping projects. These are a couple from Cuba and China. And you can see the Cuban maps don't look sophisticated, but they planted that mangrove forest and it protected that community from, um, I believe it was Maria, while everything else along the coast got devastated. We're still working with the, very closely with the 40 or so groups within Mapa Verde. Uh, Cuba. In China, this is the Mangrove Conservation Network, who uh, has made maps all along the southwest coast of China with local people, trying to protect those mangroves. Here's three examples from Irapuato, Mexico, Clackmannanshire, Scotland, and Anhui, China, that all involved young people, getting them out, getting their observations. How do they feel? Not just the scientific side of it, but also the subjective side, getting people more up to date on this. And here's one of the maps that resulted. This is Clack Manninshires. And they really uh, put inclusion, inclusion first. So it was a very socially engaged process. 
And I was happy to see that they put biodiversity and native plants at the very top of their legend. So um, this is, um, to me, a, a really good example of a local map. Here's a couple more from Asia. The top one is from um, Ansan, South Korea. This was made with government support uh, with a whole group of other maps that were produced in the areas uh, right around Seoul. And the bottom ones are from Thailand where 60 maps were made in different cities with middle schoolers and city agencies working together under the Thai Environment Institute, all mapping climate counter change measures. What are we doing about it? Um, here's an example from uh, Taiwan where a company took our process to each of their, their um, 18 factories and workspaces around the world. And for each one, they had a map with this data at the top that showed how much the mapping process improved their rate. So just for the CO2, they in this particular location, they reduced it 144 kilograms a year. So that is significant. Um, so that their the water, waste, energy management, and you can see the process was very bottom up, um, yet the maps themselves look very crisp and clean. I was invited to the data, uh, the, out, the best practices sharing workshop, and it was remarkable how many different kinds of eco and social practices were developed as part of this process. Um, here's one from New York where faith leaders worked with University, uh, excuse me, Columbia University, and they looked at eco justice. What kind of um, environmental justice issues do we have? in Harlem. And here's one made by young people just across the water in Queens where they're looking at the most polluted waterway, the Newtown Creek. And we had different waves of young people looking at that creek. It's a magnet. And on the lower right, check out dutchkillsloop.org. These, these maps actually inspired me to get involved in the development of a new um, eco-industrial park that's getting um, underway out there um, over the last five years. So hopefully it'll be open in the next five years, <laughs> um, long-term project. And I wanna highlight Mary Hunt's map here where she started on our platform, but she's done a really good job of pulling the data off and making it accessible to people who don't necessarily have computers, who are coming to see something else and they discover, look how many places we have right here where local food is being grown. And it's helped, as Mary says, people to see the big picture while appreciating individual efforts. So I love how she's framed it. And um, it's been exciting to see this project change and grow, including now actually food production in lots of places. So. Just to close out, here's a scene from the Glasgow Green Map where they have uh, created local icons and tell you just that the mapping is not only data collection, and planning and advocacy, it's engagement, it's technology mastery, it's research, it's story sharing. And as you saw with Mary's, it's creating posters. And there's also a thing called campaigns, which I think Bogdan and Alexander will tell us a little bit about in just a moment. So, oops, why am I here? Oops. So there's my last page. Again, that, that blog, our blog is going to have the update on all the events that we're doing as they are planned. And um, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And, oops. Wait, sorry, I have to skate. Uh-oh. Sorry, folks, I'm a little stuck. There we are. Okay, we're back. Okay, <laughs> and I'm I'm uh, I'm glad to see more people have joined us and welcome everybody. We're um, taping, and you can see there's a transcript going on at the bottom. I'm going to turn it over to Alexandra and Bogdan from the GIS Collective, and we're going to hear a little bit about that mapping platform. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think you need to enable when the screen sharing. Thank you. Are you muted? Muted? Yeah. You're okay now. Sorry.
You're on? Uh, let's see. Can you see? Almost. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'm going to shortly discuss a bit from the technological perspective. So how we, uh, GIS Collective, are trying to support these initiatives with technology and what kind of uh, what kind of tools we're building to um, to enable um, more of these projects. So our idea was to make a platform that makes it very easy to collaborate on mapping projects. We've been involved in some uh, projects around where we saw that mapping brought a lot of value. Um, it, through collaborating with Green Map, we saw a great potential for uh, these kinds of projects to create action and communities and collaboration. Uh, so we've seen other types of projects as well, like um, inventory, forest inventory for virgin forests, like pollinators monitoring. So we wanted a tool that uh, was open source, that was easy to use, and that was flexible enough so that it could be adapted to these different kinds of projects that have this common thread of promoting biodiversity, um, stopping climate change, and so on. Um, these are our guiding technological strengths or qualities. Uh, we want to build this platform in a way um, that makes it easy to deploy, that makes it easy to customize, that works on different environments, web and mobile, and that it also works when you're online or where, when you're in the field. So how, how does it work? The workflow right now, uh, we support GreenMap with their instance. Uh, you can make an account. Then if you have your own project, you add a team, you make a map, optionally a campaign that Wendy also mentioned, uh, and then you start mapping. You can add points, lines, and polygons and uh, invite others to collaborate on map. Uh, and we want to highlight a few of the things we support, which we think by, they also support action, collaboration, and communities growth. Uh, so I'm going to go very briefly through some of them and uh, also mention some of the latest ones. Um, so adding a license to your map, it's a very nice way to create open data to support um, sharing. Um, Wendy mentioned the icons and how they evolved uh, in the Green Map project. Uh, we think they are a very powerful tool for uh, visualizing information, for categorizing information. And so we this, this concept of icon is quite central to the platform and we allow you know, people to customize them, to extend them and to define uh, particular things they want to gather in terms of data for certain icons. Um, I mentioned adding uh, particular things for the icons. You can do that with the attributes. So you can uh, define um, questions or information that you want to gather about a place that has a certain icon. Uh, and then it's easy to ask for this information from people who co contribute. We also have privacy controls. We are aware that for some projects, there is information that can be sensitive. For example, location masking to protect wildlife. You, you maybe don't want to share with everyone where the, the particular location of a beehive or uh, endangered species. Uh, we have uh, the options for different kinds of visibility states for the maps and for what's on the maps. And we also offer fine-grained visibility control of some data points about uh, um, the different lines, polygons, or points on the map with uh, the corresponding use cases. Uh, we also want to make it easy to bring data to the platform and to get your data out of the platform. So we, we support uh, import and export. Um, we 
have been offering base maps as well. Uh, so the possibility to customize the background of the map and to add your own. Uh, more recently, we for, for the COP26 campaigns from Glasgow, we realized that it is important to be able to customize uh, your page for your project to be able to promote it and to group more campaigns together. So uh, you can also have these kinds of pages. These are only some of the campaigns for, from Glasgow uh, grouped together. And coming soon, uh, we are also working on a mobile app to make it easy to um, see places nearby when you are out to browse through existing data and campaigns, and also to be able to contribute when you're um, out and about. Um, this is a very short summary of some of the things we do with the platform. Uh, we're happy to keep in touch. Today, we won't be able to stay very long, uh, but please uh, contact us if you have other questions or you'd like to learn more. Uh, uh, just, that was really wonderful. And in a nutshell, to, to hear so much about the platform. And we have, a, since they're leaving in a minute, is there one or two quick questions for Alexandra and Bogdan who've done such amazing work with this platform? Christopher, unmute yourself. What's your software stack? What's the license? Oh. <laughs> and how many pins? How many pins can you support on a typical cell phone? <laughs> yeah. So we have a custom solution. We program everything from scratch. Um, in terms of what we support, um, our stack is quite performant. So we already have like more than 50,000 points, points stored in the database and we can handle much more, maybe hundreds of thousands, who knows. We never pushed it to its limit, but uh, basically we can handle a lot of data. And the code is open source. You can find it on GitLab. Um, you find uh, you can find the link to our repositories on our website. Thank you. And um, there's a request to add the links from the last slide to the chat. Can you do that before you go? And I wonder if anybody else has one more question before um, the GIS collective has to has to run. And will the recording be available? You're gonna uh, of this session. Uh, yes. That, okay, that would be great. Yeah. I know that went by fast, didn't it? Yeah. I'm <laughs> but really there's so much good information. I yeah. Know. I know. And I'm really thrilled that Bogdan and Alexandra are coming to Danoon. Woohoo! So the end of October, there's going to be a, a um, and maybe other people want to come too. Um, Anna, if you want to say something about it, go right ahead. Well, everyone's welcome to Danoon. I mean, as long as, yeah, no, just, just coming as a year. So Wendy's coming from the, the 27th, Wendy, to the 31st. And um, there's a few other people popping up as well. A growing a growing crowd, it seems. So yeah, people are more than welcome. We're based here in the pop shop and we'll be doing tours around the Cow Peninsula, which is the peninsula that the Janine is on. So yeah, just catch up later about that. And I want to say the 29th is the day that the member of the Scottish Parliament is going to join us. Um, Arianne Burgess from the Green Party will be there. Um, she's my former neighbor, and this is her district. And it's just really a nice, I think it'll be a wonderful convergence in a beautiful place. So um, we'll do what we can to share it out. Um, Thank you so much to Bogdan and Alexandra for all that they are doing. You have no idea how much they do for us and <laughs> how much it's appreciated. I think we're up to 66 maps that are public now on our platform. So we're doing pretty good. Thank you so much. And thank um, you. Yay. And, and we're looking forward to go to the moon. <laughs> I'm delighted. Yay, and uh, let's turn it over now to Neil, who's in um, Glasgow. 
where this all the world's attention is now focused. Thanks very much and good evening, everyone. Um, are you able to just give me, I can share my screen, yeah? Yeah. No, just go yes. Um, so I've got a couple of, oh, let me just go back to the start. Just to put, uh, I suppose, a wee bit of context. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. Looks so, good. Yep. So, oh, is this on? Uh, okay. The wonders of uh, PowerPoint. So, yeah, so our mission is, uh, this is just going to roll. I've got auto scroll set up. Apologies. Um, I'm going to go back. So, yeah, our mission is to enable and facilitate and empower local people and organizations to get informed, get involved and get active. Um, and one of the ways we do this is by using maps. And we hope that by collecting information, presenting information and uh, yeah, just it changes the conversation, it empowers people in different ways. And then hopefully that that, that will result in individual and collective action um, to make a difference for, for people, place and planet. Um, a lot of what we do is about getting people together, getting people active, getting people outdoors, um, making the connections and, and, and working from there. In terms of uh, maps, we've the Hannah, myself and Wendy first met, um, I'm going to say 12, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, we, Hannah and I brought Wendy to Glasgow to the Science Centre, which is actually going to be the venue for COP, one of the venues for COP26 for a green map system uh, uh, event um, just after. I think Hannah might have still been at the Glasgow School of Art as well. Um, yeah, so we've used the green map system in various guises over the years. Um, we also produced hard copy maps, um, mind maps. Um, we've got online geographical maps to collect information. As I said, a key part of this is, is about capturing a lot of the discussion, a lot of the information that happens in the community and at community level and being able to present it back to the community um, to, so that information is in the public domain. Um, it's being shared and it's being built on and, and it's helping, um, I said, it's, it's about informing people and informing discussions, uh, influencing policy and, and decision making. And obviously a lot of that's related to local issues uh, and assets. Um, in terms of the Glasgow Green Map, so this is a partnership we have with Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. So Stop Climate Chaos Scotland is a membership organisation of um, a wide variety of uh, civic society organisations um, who've come together um, to, yeah, and they were, the, they were the driving force behind the, the Climate Change Act, uh, the Climate Change Bill here in, here in Scotland, which has laid the, the foundations for so much work that's going on. So Stop Climate Chaos Scotland uh, hosted a student placement from Glasgow University um who so we worked with uh, joanne and helped uh, develop the, the initial map um, and she set up and supported a volunteer group who started to populate the map um, and look at the, the the campaign features which i'll share with you in the, in the chat in a moment um, so the purpose was basically to provide a one-stop shop it was for about collecting information that would be useful for people who were visiting the city during the cop but really importantly, and this was, uh, you know, COP's going to be this massive, massive thing that rolls into Glasgow. It's here for a couple of weeks and then it'll roll out of town again. So it's really important as some sort of legacy. Um, already on my, so I, I commute about 10 kilometres uh, by bike to work. I'm right, uh, literally right past the venue um, that you can see in the, the top right hand corner. I cycle past past that most days has to, I have to point out it's, it's not usually as uh, blue sky and dry <laughs> um but that's uh, but that's all going to be shut off uh during cop um so and the, the building big uh, venue uh, additional venues to the venues that are there temporary structures um so it's already starting to have an impact on people in glasgow um so yeah so as i said but it's very important that this map was seen as a legacy so a couple of things that um uh Bogdan and Alexander talked about there that we've we've been tapping into so uh, Joanne the student placement she developed some bespoke icons um to be used on the maps and then we've also used this really useful campaign feature and I'll come back to that the the, the thinking behind the or the 
the benefit of the campaign feature is one, it allows you to crowdsource a lot of info, but it acts as a filter in terms of what type of information you're looking for and which icons people can see. Um, so it's a really useful, uh, a really useful tool. And that's just the link to, to the map there. Um, my contact details are here. Uh, and I'm just going to stop sharing um, the screen uh, and then I'll share the link to um, just get this up into the chat. Yeah, so this is the link that, um, that Bogdan, uh, Bogdan has uh, highlighted, um, which is the link to the campaigns and I'll share a link to a specific campaign. Um, and you can you can see the the type of information um, that, that the campaigns ask for, um, so they're really useful really useful feature, um, and it's been great that we've now got this feature where we can we can collect all of those campaigns together on on the Open Green Map website. <clears throat> um, so the plan is still to continue to um, source more information. <clears throat> excuse me. In the run up to COP, but um, as I said, the the idea that that we will then host as as Glasgow Eco Trust, we will then host um, the the map moving forward, um, and we will look to <clears throat> move that into different communities and build on that <clears throat> for whatever they they feel they need. Um, I think that's me, Wendy. If there's any questions? Anybody have a quick question for Neil? I'm so excited. Now, Neil is probably, Neil and his team have made the most campaigns of anybody for a single map. So for us, it's been an interesting experiment in seeing how that plays out. Um, we just made one here in New York. There's a beautiful native plant garden that's being um, bulldozed, I hate to use that word, and so we created very quickly a campaign that lets people say where they're moving the plants. So now we have about a dozen locations where the plants from that garden are on the map. So we can see how that changed. And all we had to do was provide a, a QR code and a, a link and people were able to add. So I'll put that in the chat so you can see it. And I'm also going to put in here the URL where you can see all our fall events. But now, is there anyone else with a question for Neil? Yes. Okay. Oh, yep. just a comment. I just, I, I just really appreciate that that campaign page in particular, and it's just really inspiring. I look forward to spending some time uh, diving into it, uh, and I will, I will share it with our community mapping class students tomorrow. So I'm hoping there'll be some way that we can bring in students to uh, the, the COP26 experience as well. I mean, I'd love to chat further about that. Yeah. That is terrific. Thanks, Ken. Sure. Um, go yeah. ahead, Christopher. Yeah, so my interest is in mapping organizations um, engaged in COP26, the alternative organizations. Are, are you building such a map or are you adding that to your map? Thing or is that am I doing something completely separate? So there's two things that are happening. So there's the um, UK Climate uh, Climate Coalition um, is has put together. They've got I think there's uh, I'm going to say 15 thematic working groups like logistics, finance, uh, police liaison, um, and one of them is a local Glasgow group. And as part of that, a database of um, civic society groups has been put together. Um, now that was the purpose of that was to drive a kind of database um, I, approach, which um, I'll, I'll dig the link out and send that around, but they've not been, unfortunately, they've not been mapped. Now, one of the, and one of the reasons they've not been mapped is that a lot of the groups don't have a physical location. So, um, whilst there are, there, um, that was one of the, um, so in terms of the, the Glasgow Green Map, there was a focus on, I suppose, uh, in, independent and social enterprise bike shops, uh, independent cafes, um, community venues, community cafes. Um, so that was one way that information was captured. But yeah, the, the, I think that's one of the, 
I suppose one of the interesting learning experiences that this is a you know in terms of the, the green map system is a geographical map um, and that doesn't necessarily suit uh, everything that could or should be mapped um, so I think that's a, an interesting point right so lots of organizations cover regions there's some international there's some Scottish there's some provincial there's some city and there's some that have specific locations so I'd be really so actually and my software does that correctly. Actually, if you go to greenmaps.us slash world, you'll see a Scottish the preliminary Scottish example. So I'd love to actually build that map for them of those organizations because I it's green maps, multiple maps at different levels of the hierarchy, and each one has a list of the regional ones as well as the pins. So I'd love to connect with that group and turn it into a map. It would be perfect. Okay. Particularly if they have the database already, just import yeah. the data. I'm a happy man. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'm glad to hear that. That's a that's a, another positive thing we can possibly contribute to all of this gathering. I went to the one in Copenhagen, and it was very hard to keep track of the people I met with after the fact. So maybe this is um, a linkage we can make right here. That's awesome. Hey, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. Thank you so much, Neil. That was really good. And helped me and I think all of us feel more connected to what's going on there, even, you know, knowing that things are starting to get built and change and the goal of having a le the legacy. That's terrific. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah now, who's going to talk some about a more rural, rural sorry, <laughs> rural approach. <laughs> Thank you. So can everyone see my screen? Yeah, cool, in agreement. So this is me, uh, Hannah of Tacit Tacit. Um, and just for, to help with some of the geography of this, because um, we're all about maps. So I'm based in Danoon and it is about 35 miles west of Glasgow. And you can get here by train, by car, by bike, um, and by boat uh, as well. So we're not so far, um, although sometimes it does feel very remote. Um, so we're kind of a peninsula, but you can access us by road. So my sort of starting point for working with green maps um, really started out of a long term fascination with the fact that we throw stuff away. Um, this book, which some of you may be familiar with um, by Vance Packard, is one of the first books that started to talk about inbuilt obsolescence and the fact that, yeah, we're, we're just making stuff and then not really looking after it and then getting shot of it. When I moved to Glasgow, I was totally fascinated by the fact that there was so much stuff um, being chucked away and being sold through markets and through charity shops. Um, it inspired a lot of my work. I was training at the art school as a textile designer. And so a lot of the materials I actually used ended up and, and the images ended up being from um, sort of like these places. Um, and I also took a real interest in the history of charity shops and actually volunteered in a few and gathered some of that information um, way back. Um, and this project, cut a long story, story short, ended up as a green map. And on meeting Wendy and Neil, um, we actually were able to raise enough funds to actually get a green map printed that focused very much on reuse, so a thematic green map. And it was the first time that anyone had thought, I think, to pull all this information together. So this was about 2002, 2003. Um, and I was working at the time in the sort of community re reuse and recycling sector. And one of the ongoing issues that that sector has is people making poor donations. So donations that are not necessarily helping those organisations. So another sort of consequence of the map was an educational tool as well. It was developed by a load of volunteers who worked every Thursday night in a place called the CCA, which is the Centre for Contemporary Arts, in an open source space actually called the Electron Club. And we met and whilst we were doing data gathering, they were also working on a, a sort of Google based map as well. So it was really before sort of Google was very advanced and we had a load of programmers. And so we meet and we do this and we did it for over a year. Um, anyway, it resulted in this map. Um, and it, did, it was a, there was a digital element to it as well, but actually the paper based map was the thing that people really liked, and so we continue to go into two editions of this. And um, yeah, over 100 charity shops and community reuse projects were, were sort of brought together um, through that project, 
and we really try to link it to sort of this idea of sustainable living as well so you can get through here things by bike or by walking um and stuff so this idea this this sustainable development goal of responsible consumption and production has kind of stuck with me um, and just in the last month, my, uh, I've got, I'm very lucky at the moment, I've got a lovely design assistant called Eilish, who happens to be on this call as well. And she was tasked with creating essentially Danoon's green map of recycling, repair and sharing. So she's been out talking to people in the charity shops and gathering information because although we're a really small town, there's actually quite a few charity shops. There's also private businesses who offer repair services and increasingly there's people who are also offering things like share, sharing of tools and stuff so um i initially was visited denise men shed which she would highly recommend um and discovered all sorts of things that are going on there where they've got amazing equipment that they can repair stuff they also recycle bikes and um, we've also got bernardo's here as well but many other sort of little charitable and enterprising and stuff going on one of the really nice things about doing this work as well is that we're getting to talk to people and asking them questions and actually you can see from this comment um that you know there's, there's a struggle there to do marketing for these small organizations and we're getting a sense of, of some of the challenges that they're sort of seeing through the through talking to people coming into the shops as well um and actually you know in a place like Danoon, um what are what i suppose we're trying to do as well is gather information so we can then develop projects with people we're working a lot with the community development trust at the moment and trying to respond to local needs um one of the things in this town though and i think with rural communities is a starting point for and a starting point for some of the mapping projects that i've most recently done is about valuing what you have first um and one of the things we're not so great at in Danoon is it is is really sharing our heritage we're a town like any other places um, that have got a lot of heritage, but we don't articulate that heritage very well and don't tell stories particularly well. So this was a project we did um, just after, sort of, I suppose, the first lockdown. And it was really a really simple idea where we just got all postcards of Danoon because it's a tourist town. We've got small postcards of the area and we just started to put them up around the town to create a little postcard trail there. Um, to encourage people to cycle and walk and just share information about the heritage of the area. And we collated this information and we, I'm now sort of talking to you from a place called The Pop Shop, which is just on a high street. And so that became a sort of central hub of information. So a really simple idea that was, we did put stuff on the digital map, but actually it was a very physical green mapping project. Um, later on, that project sort of evolved into now an app for Danoon so um, if you do visit or even if you don't visit you can download this app and find out about Danoon um, but we used actually the digital mapping tools to start to lay out the trails that to prepare for making this app so it was a really useful tool there we combined it with um, a sort of app to a tracking app of open source tracking app as well to collate information on um, on G uh, with GPX so then we could input, we could upload that to the digital map to create digital trails that were really helpful when we created um, the app. Um, part of the work as well that I've been doing around heritage, um, one of the um, sort of stories that we've uncovered through doing sort of research here around heritage is the story of a soft drinks factory that um, used to exist in Deneen until about the 1970s, from about the 1880s. Um, it was called the George Sterling sort of soft drinks factory. And one of the really interesting things about soft drinks um, is really that they're a product of empire. They exist because you got your ingredients, including your sugar from all over the globe, and then you sort of brought them back to sort of small producers. Um, and then you kind of created syrups and then carbonated these drinks. So one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is how to sort of use this heritage to create a new social enterprise um, called Danoon Ghost Pop. Um, and share stories, share information and educate people about sort of the history of pop making in Danoon, but also engage people in conversations about the impacts of pop making in Danoon and other places as well. And so we've started to map, um, use the digital tools to sort of map those connections, if you like. So we've got the original George Sterling Drinks Factory, and we've also got um, this delightful gentleman here called James Ewing, who built a house in Danoon, Castle House, which now houses the museum, 
but also had sugar plantations in Jamaica. So just trying to sort of make these connections through sort of mapping things. And we're about to start a new project um, on West Bay, which is a beach that's just sort of in just off the town centre. And it's called We Are Building a Beach Hut. And basically West Bay is an area that has been sort of flagged up for, for sort of regeneration. But obviously it's at the intersection between where the where water and sea is and people are. So what we're doing is we're going to use that project to um, first of all research with people through green mapping intensively the West Bay area um, just all the heritage of the place but also it used to be a place where there were beach huts it's a place now where people are increasingly swimming and there's activity going on and there's also sort of hidden stories as well so we're going to work with Wendy and local people to sort of uncover that and put that on a digital based green map and hopefully a paper based green map as well and then we're going to use that information to support the development of a design of a beach hut so that has to then respond to some of the stuff that's on the green map as well so um that's just an overview of how i've been using um mapping in my work and um yeah i really enjoy the sort of process and think it's a really fantastic methodology for starting projects as well so um and yes and if you are in danoon <laughs> at the end of the month then please feel free we're in the pop shop and my contact details are there and i'll put them in the chat Okay. <laughs> that was really exciting. Thank you so much, Hannah. Anybody have any questions for her about Danoon? What is a beach hut? That's one of my questions. <laughs> what is it? We don't know yet, Wendy. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, well, we imagine it a beach hut. Traditionally, a beach hut was changing hut. They used to get wheeled into the sea. So in the sort of like early Georgian era, era, they started off being used. So people used to get a duking, go into the healing waters of the sea. But then later on, they sort of, in Danoon particularly, they were actually just places where boat hirers sort of had beach huts and you'd hire your boat from them. And there was like 50 of them, I think, around in the sort of 1950s, 60s, you know, oh, sorry, about 30 of them in the 1950s and 60s. And then they sort of disappeared when the, the, the town sort of took a decline um and everyone stopped visiting <laughs> um so yeah we're putting hoping to put a beach hut back that's all about I'm, bring, I'm bringing my bathing suit who has a question well i just want to say hannah your Hello. enthusiasm is so infectious <laughs> so where where was the mosquito that bit you how did it start it's just like whoo Oh, oh is it? well, I don't know. I don't know. I drive myself mad with this stuff. So I don't know if it's a mosquito that bit me. <laughs> that would explain a lot to be frank. <laughs> but I think this is the secret of all the green maps. Somebody has to really bottle it. This is it. I can't believe it. All of you just whoop and putting your life into it. I mean, it's just, it makes me have hope. Let's put it that way. So Hannah, that was just, you're actually, you look like Rosie from talking. <laughs> what can I say? It's, my, it's the little bottle of wine I've got down by the side, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's nice. Shira, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I just had a question. Firstly, yeah, just thanks, Hannah. That was really kind of inspirational, just kind of hearing what you're doing like on the ground and just kind of getting community is involved in a local scale because ultimately that's what kind of needs to happen now it's down to like everyone to get involved and just try and embed it in everyone's kind of daily routine as much as anything because a lot of it will be down to kind of behavioral change as much as anything and just the role that I think mapping can play and just I suppose raising awareness as much as, as anything and um, but I was just wondering just in terms of like how you've worked with um, local communities, did you ever kind of run workshops or was it very much kind of one to one that you ended up going down the route of um, just in terms of maybe your previous projects, but also this upcoming um, Beach Hut one? Yeah, so to be honest, so far in Dunoon anyway, it's been quite a sort of small group of people that have been involved in the mapping and it's been more for public engagement purposes. So the heritage stuff was really a response to, I suppose, COVID and just trying to create something that was interesting, that was 
free and that was about just sort of giving just just giving a little bit of, of sort of an incidental things that, that sort of just to make people's lives feel a little bit better maybe and we got little we got some we got we got some really nice sort of comments and stuff because there is no interpretation here which actually means that a lot of the stories that connect people to place don't exist they exist in little pockets but they're not widely and publicly available unless you're a sort of heritage buff so it was really about that sort of the thing the i suppose the the sugar the Deningo's pop map is something we're doing so i work with a few people um, on that project and it's something that We'll, we'll be hopefully doing over the next kind of couple over the next year really so as, as yet we're, we're sort of yet to see it but it'll be a small group of people but what we're doing with the beach up project is very much starting off where we, the green map creates an access point into this so people can join in 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 different ways i'm at the moment slightly challenged because we wanted to do it with school kids but school kids are quite difficult to get hold of at the moment and um, even though we're directly opposite a primary school that just the way that COVID has affected the schools is, is, is creating challenges for us but we will probably just end up doing workshops on West Bay and just asking people to be honest because it's a really simple thing and I'm also going to be doing interviews with with people. there's a woman on West Bay who's who's a hundred and she's lived there for most of her life so tomorrow I'm actually going to do like an oral histories with her and because the digital green map can take sound what I'm hoping is that we could upload that interview and stuff so the map is kind of a bit of sound and oral histories as well so we're it's in its broadest sense we're sort of trying to find different ways for different groups of getting people involved does that make sense yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thanks. I, I think the whole ma mapping potential as well, um, in terms of not only mapping what's there, but also potentially looking at, you know, future projects or and or risks, and then having that kind of local context of like climate adaptation as well as to what places how and how they might adapt, but having that as a community conversation that people can add their concerns to. And it's yes, it's not necessarily something that's there at the moment, but it's, you know, corralling people together to actually, you know, come up with a kind of like holistic set of things that they want to do. And if it's mapped, then it's accessible to everyone. Um, and I'm also involved in a community interest company called Imagine If, and we've got what we're calling a, a reimagine map. But we've, I, I didn't know about this green maps thing, which sounds amazing, this platform. And um, so we've just been using like a Google Maps overlay, but it's essentially taking places and reimagining them. So anyone can join in and upload it to our website. So we've just been mainly based in Edinburgh at the moment. And um, but as part of the Climate Fringe Week, we're kind of opening it to the UK and anyone can kind of participate. So from like car parks, turning them into like allotment spaces or just trying to raise general things about how places that are maybe underutilized could actually be have co benefits as much as anything. So yeah, no, it just it just really chimed. So thank you very much, and it was great. You've got to, to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'll be in Edinburgh for a few days, and maybe there's a chance to talk together. Um, I'm going to the TED Countdown Conference from October uh, 12th to 15th, and I'm there for a few days after. So if you want to get in touch. Let's, uh, I'll put my email in the um, chat here. Um, but I think part of what you're pointing out is one of the cool things about how this project works. And I see Mary has her hand up. So let me let Mary go ahead. Okay. Um, just want to tag on um, that you want to do that interview because we were doing podcasts over here and I was wondering how much could be taken on the green map base. And we decided we were going to put the podcast somewhere else and link over to them. And then they can be any length and we're not loading up the system too much. I don't know if that's changed at all or you want to address that, Wendy? You know, I honestly have not remembered to ask the question, what's the size limit on the... the well, the I did ask them and they were... Um, thought we'd get better because you just never know. And pretty soon, if you can imagine if everybody had videos and everything on this database, it'd be just huge. Right. Um, so maybe just to be a safety sake, if it's a very long interview, I would set it up. You can just put maybe a partial and then link over to the whole one somewhere else. I don't know. Just yep. putting it out there so we don't get tricked up in it. Good. 
thank you. And thank you, Neil just sent me Chair's email. So that will expedite connecting. And, you know, all of us are around. I want to give a shout out to a couple people for a minute since we're almost at time. And one is uh, Ciprian who's on his iPhone there. He's in Romania and Chip is the person who's kept the original Open Green Map platform up and on and moving, which he fixed just a few hours ago. And he also manages greenmap.org. So many, many thanks to Chip, who's um, I think going to have a little video ready for one of the show, one of the pro pro events we're trying to organize in um, for later, closer to the cop. I don't know if you want to say hi, Chip, but I see you're on your phone. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Paul McKay, who's in um, London and is the person be, who got us really thinking about this food icon question. And now we have a test set up. And um, I don't know if he's been using them. What do you say, Paul? Anything? You want to add a comment? It's a work in progress, but yes, I am trying to uh, get them set up. Yeah. So Paul also helped us get our iconography onto Wikimedia. No, is that right? What's it on? Wiki? Wikidata. Wikidata. Thank you. And has been helping us behind the scenes become more part of the open source world, which is terrific. Um, I know people have to have to run and we're wrapping up. Does anybody else want to add something who hasn't spoken yet? Maybe Eilish hasn't. Um. Yeah, I guess so. I'm working with Hannah on the reuse and repair map. Um, and I do think, I mean, I was just kicking a thought, I guess, but I do think that like for our generation, um, so I'm in my 20s, like early 20s. And I do think I had never heard of this before, before working with Hannah. So thank you for sharing it with me, because I do think it's very important for our, us, especially as the next generation to kind of keep this going. Um, and I do really like using it. I've really enjoyed making my map. So I'm excited to kind of get cracking with it. Terrific. I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you soon. Um, yes. yes, you will probably meet me when I'm over at the pop shop someday. Right. And Manda, are you, what, would you like to say something? Maybe. I don't know where Manda is from, but. Um, I know where Manda's from, Danoon. She's, oh, she's she in the is. She's the other half of Danone Goes Pop. <laughs> Three of third of Danone Goes Pop. There's three of us doing Danone Goes Pop. So, yeah. And I'm I sure. see, I, yeah, and I see, and I see in the chat, it's time for a new European Green Map Makers meeting. Maybe this is something we can start to plan when we're together. I'll, I'm willing to be European if I have to. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, anybody else? Last comment, and then we'll say thank you, everybody. Um, just one more thing. So I think when Wendy's over, um, we're still, I'm, my diary is kind of a bit all over the place, but it would be lovely to meet more people using green mapping. I'm actually going to meet with Enid quite soon, Wendy, and do some t training with her. But if anybody else um, is interested in just going through green mapping tools, just on a, on a Scotland wide basis, then um, do get in touch and we can sort of have it. I've been doing sort of wee sessions with people one on one. Um, I've had got a little bit of money from Creative Scotland and they've been sort of supporting um, this project. So, um, yeah, and when Wendy's over, if we can orchestrate a meetup, then that would be brilliant, whether it be Danoon or Edinburgh or wherever. Anyway, that's me. <laughs> it's great. I am really thrilled. This has been wonderful for me. This is the beginning of the journey um, to come and see and work with Neil and Hannah and now Eilish and Amanda and hopefully Chiara. And <laughs> <laughs> everybody else who's going to be around um, during the COP. You know, um, it's got to work this time. The COP has to be, it needs us, right? So let's do what we can to connect the dots and make more happen um, while people are together and back home. So um, thank you all for coming today and um, happy first day of autumn. Thank you, Jean, for reminding us. And Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.